to raise it as a, a, an issue to uh, say yes it is important for lesbians to have perhaps news just as much as straight women. Uh, in fact sometimes we think that lesbians might be more prone to some of the risks for uh, cervical cancer. What happens is basically you go in, uh, have a discussion with the doctor first or the nurse, a lot of nurses can do perhaps news too now, mm -hmm. um, then usually it's done lying on your back um, with your legs apart um, using what we tastefully call a speculum, mm -hmm. which nowadays a lot of us use a, a small plastic one which is a lot more comfortable. <laughs> Lots of stretching, <laughs> that. you can do absolutely anything <laughs> with that. Actually, great, I've made the vest out of dental dams. Did you? I mean, firstly, they're one use only, so that's important. Secondly, important to use some lube underneath on the skin surface uh -huh. so that it's uh, less likely to break. Right. Um, but also, the problem with dental dams is that it's only protecting us from certain external STDs like warts or herpes. Yeah. And sure, there's a, a place, but it's not protecting us from any penetrating uh, STDs which exist. You know, chlamydia can be transferred between women, mm -hmm. um, something called Gardnerella, which is a vaginal bug, even thrush. It's very difficult. You know, the guys are finding that too, you know, that there's a lot less condom use uh, in certain areas of the community, in the gay mm -hmm. community, uh, and likewise in the lesbian community. We're at a disadvantage because we haven't had the big publicity campaigns related to HIV, and uh, so a lot of lesbians out there are saying we don't need to use anything and it's very much starting from the beginning with uh, people on a one-to-one -one basis. It's got a lot of different resources for lesbians but uh, particularly there's a, a few resources for women looking at becoming parents. Um, basically there's a group in the in the southeast uh, for lesbians and also a group called Prospective Les Lesbian Parents in the north. Uh, and these, these groups really can help uh, provide a lot of information about where to find sperm donors, about the medical information that, that uh, you need. Everybody knows about HIV testings, but of course there are, there are other STDs that you can be tested for. Yeah, people right? think about going and having a blood test, and they think just about having the HIV test. But they tend to forget a little bit about getting tested for hepatitis. Hepatitis A and B are the ones that are really common in the gay community that I think people forget about a little bit. So hepatitis A and B are sexually transmitted? Yeah. Such? Yeah, what, the, what can you say about them? How, how do we catch them? Well, hepatitis A is transmitted by poo, basically. So, um, by poo? Yes. Any I sort knew of, this thing would have Any contact... We have to get over you. We have to be able to embrace these absolutely words, don't we, in order to do this segment <laughs> well. Anybody sort of has contact with other people's bottoms, basically, <laughs> right. is going to be at some risk for hepatitis A. OK. Uh, and hepatitis B is transmitted like HIV, blood and body fluids, but it's much, much more infectious. So. Safe sex is just designed actually p to prevent transmission of HIV and it's not particularly good at preventing the transmission of hepatitis A or hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. So people have to go to their doctor, uh, get tested first off, there's no point in vaccinating somebody if they've already got it or if they've already been exposed to it in the past, no. get tested, they come back to get their test results a week or two later, then they can start the vaccination process. If, if, if people are going to develop symptoms, they'll get like a sometimes like a milky, creamy discharge from the tip of the it penis. It so revolves too. you too much, yes. And some burning and stinging when you pass urine. That's if it's in the penis, but it also can be caught in the throat and also in the anal canal. So okay. And this is se oh, sexually transmitted through what, how do we, do we need to know? Just about any sort of direct contact, really. It can be oral sex, even sort of direct 
rubbing of people's genitals. It doesn't really? need to be sort of unprotected anal sex or anything like that. It really can be really basic sort of contact can spread it. Uh, <laughs> Schoolboys sort of frighten each other with terrible stories about umbrellas and spikes and things like that. But it's in fact a really basic, uh, a really basic test. So I brought a swab along. Okay. It looks very long, but basically this little tiny cotton wool bud is put just into the tip of the penis like that. How far does it have to go in? Just that far? Oh, about a centimetre, something like that. So uh, safe to say that it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's yeah, not unbearable. Exactly right. People referring to party drugs, they're mainly sort of the group of drugs which are called stimulants. And the main one would be ecstasy and speed or amphetamines, I suppose the ones that are most commonly used party drugs. Okay. So if how does how, how do we minimise the risk involved? Yeah. I mean, what are the dangers associated with some of these drugs? I suppose? One of the main risks, Kay, is that because they're illegal, um, people don't know what they're getting. I mean, if a doctor prescribes an antibiotic or something like that, you can be absolutely 100% sure that what was prescribed is what they're getting. But dealers will cut things in, you know, you sort of buy, if somebody buys a drug, they really can't be sure whether they're getting what they're paid for or other drugs. Often they're cut with a bit of heroin and caffeine and strychnine and mm -hmm. uh, amphetamine. So there, there's, there's a risk to start with that you don't know what you're taking. I I would like very much to welcome to this episode of your host, Mr. Wayne Key. Wayne, you're welcome. Wayne is the author of this book. It's called Black Hours. And we'll be talking about this book for the next few minutes or so. I have to confess, I haven't read all of your book, but, I, but the, the parts that I've read I really enjoyed. When we, you, because we did do an interview on Joy Melbourne, which That's was right. fascinating, and you said that, I said, you know, when did you write the book? And you said, well, I've been writing it all my life. But we were just talking before we started the, the cameras. There was a catalyst for the actual putting the words in, on paper for you? Yes, there was a catalyst in there. Um, I, at 45, I found myself with an alcohol problem and I ended up joining a recovery program. And as part of that, those programs are about oneself and um, how you perceive yourself, I suppose. Part of my recovery in that, the early days of my recovery in that process was I realised that I'd thrown away my youth, I'd thrown away my good looks, which were going through alcohol, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not only affects your liver, it affects everything. Mm. Um, great opportunities, I'd had a wonderful life. I, 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 even I knew that, even f before my alcoholism, I knew that I'd had a wonderful life. And uh, I realised, but why did I do it, you know, I, rightly or wrongly, unfortunately I think sometimes for myself, I think that it's, I'm one of those people who has to have the how, where, where and why of it all. Mm -hmm. And I realised that I didn't know anything about my mother's childhood, you know, and children are defined by their parents. My mother had these three little standard anecdotes of her childhood, and each time I would ask her about her childhood, she'd say, oh, you don't want to know about that. It's in the past. Um, she was part of the Australian generation. So I had to kind of uh, outwit her, so I told them I was writing a book. Well, it took me six to nine months. My mother, uncle, and aunt, my grandmother's three eldest children. And they told me this story that completely horrified me. I was, I swear, I think even in the book I say, if I'd had a machine gun, I would have come out and just started shooting all the Christians I could see because yeah. I was just, I was horrified, I was insulted, I was, I was hurt, I was everything and that basically was the catalyst for the book, okay. I, I think. It, it's, it struck me when I was, uh, while I'm reading your book that it, terms like the stolen generation really almost don't mean anything until you, you link them up to a story. That's right, so exactly. Um, I, I think that's that connection, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's what you're doing? Yes. It, they, they call you a new Australian talent on the, t on the cover of your book. How does that feel? <laughs> I'll take the compliment, thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, part of me had always wanted to write. I, I don't know if I ever could write, to be honest with you. Um, that was your cue to compliment me. Ah, um, uh, yes. Well, you can write. I found <laughs> it very easy to read. Thank you. I don't know if I can write. I certainly hope so. I've always wanted to. Well, that's a lie. I, I knew in my late 20s that I wanted to. Um, I read The Chant of Jimmy's 
blacksmith between Sydney and Honolulu on my way back to New York in 75 and was most impressed that a white person could write from an Aboriginal perspective, but I thought that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. And I was going to write the great Australian novel and it turned out that I, it, this has got nothing to do with what I started out. Somewhere in a trunk in Brooklyn in New York, there's a hundred pages of my first manuscript. I'm glad, <laughs> I hope the place is burnt down so they're destroyed because it has nothing to do with this, of course. D did you have to kind of remove yourself from the circumstances a little bit to be able to give it perspective? May I just share something in that sense because I think it'll answer the question. I remember it, part, of, part of the book was great for me in the sense of healing and it was a cathartic sort of type of exercise for me. Um, and I remember sitting there writing, there's a story in there about my father giving my brothers and sisters money to go and buy lollies, in, as we called them in those days. And I never got any. And those old painful memories and I was sitting there crying and this little voice in my head said, you're supposed to be writing it, Wayne, not reliving it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You, you did work with the United Nations. I did, I had ten wonderful years. Okay, and, that, and the, the thing about that I guess is that, that that actually gave you the opportunity to travel. Oh yes, yes. Um, it, tr it was really, it, it, I was running away, but it was a great way to run. Okay. I didn't actually run, I flew everywhere, which was fabulous, of course. Um, yeah. I was really running away. I was trying to... People don't realise what Australia was like in the 60s, okay? They, I, th I don't... Well, the people of my generation will and do, perhaps, but um, it was really bad mm -hmm. here, you know? Um, mm. And I... Part of that, it, part of the story of, of relating stolen generation, because all that that has kind of shock waves, you know, that when so, when a catastrophe like that happens, it's like th dropping a pebble in a pond, you know. You may drop the pebble, you have no control over the mm -hmm. ripples, mm -hmm. and those ripples are still coming out within the Aboriginal community, even to this day. Um, I think the Aboriginal, Aboriginal community has to get a grasp here and say, yes, it's true, it was all, and it's all historical but this is not a way to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, my own slide into alcoholism w was proof that this isn't a way to live. Yeah, I guess the thing is when, when you don't have any understanding of your past, you, you tend to bury the pain or to try and hide yourself from the pain. That's right, you see, and, and in that sense, you see, I had no past in that sense because children are defined by their parents and my parents didn't have one either. They had no childhood to speak of. So all those things, you know, uh, you have no sense of who you are, where you belong, and you literally have no roots. <laughs> Back I'm, I'm, I'm back in Australia and I enjoy being in Australia. Um, uh, it is my home. It was, I, I suppose this is going to sound dreadful. People talk. I was grateful for my alcoholism. It, it forced me to deal with issues that I probably never would have done under other circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, it brought me to a sense of myself and so that now I'm quite happy here and I feel I belong. Okay. I think that Australia, there are problems facing Australia. I think that they, they do have to be dealt with. But yes, I'm happy and I'm glad and grateful to be here. It's a great country in a whole lot of ways, you know. I mean, it's not Paris, let's get real here, but, you know. <laughs> it's not Paris and it's not New York. And it's not New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With, uh, we, we talked a little bit during our Joy Melbourne interview, the whole, the, this, the, what you call the double whammy. Yes. Which is the thing about being gay as well as being Aboriginal. Yes. So, uh, do, do have you, ex what kind of a racism have you experienced in the gay communities? Um, I'll be 51 on the 19th of February. It's been a long time since I've been on the streets, believe me. But I hear it's improved now, but at, when I was 18, 19, when I came out in Sydney, 67-ish, 68-ish, um, 
it was dreadful. You know, I, I had this feeling that I had been locked out and suddenly I found myself with hopefully a community that I was going to belong to and no, I didn't belong. Mm -hmm. I was still, they were as racist as mainstream. Mm -hmm. It has changed and I understand from a whole lot of young Aborigines that it has changed but at that period it was no different from being mainstream, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I say even in the book in that sense that, you know, um, gays in that sense are still white when they walk down the footpath. I'm still an Aborigine mm -hmm. and I'm on that level, I'm still discriminated against because I'm Aboriginal as opposed to being gay and, and Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, it kind of puts you in the position of being a, a banner waver. Uh, I'm just wondering how you feel about that. Uh, it, you, the bottom line is you're <laughs> the only published sort of gay <laughs> Aboriginal person in Australia. Uh, am I? I don't know, you know, I think protest, one protests in one's own way and, in, and I, perhaps even in that sense, the book is my protest. Right. Um, am I a banner waver? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I do my protest in my own way, how, and whether that's acceptable to other people, mm, sure, you know, that's just the way it goes, Kate. With your, um, over the last few years, of course, we've had the whole, um, advent, I guess, of one, the whole One Nation phenomena. Um, so um, have you reflected, had time to reflect on, on what that has done to Australia and how, how it's sort of going? Right? I think the wonderful part is that it's, um, you know, one of the things that really disturbed me as an Aborigine um, was the silence that surrounded racism. The great part about One Nation is that Australians most white Australians stood up and said, this is not acceptable. That is wonderful. It has had negative aspects, don't get me wrong. Sure. But it's, I think the, the positive, that is, people don't want that attitude anymore. That was a great joy to me. Mm. I think we've still got a long way to go in this country. Yeah. Well, I certainly commend you. It's a fantastic book. Uh, I would recommend it. It's called Black Hours and published by Harper and Collins. Harper Collins. Mm -hmm. You can get through Angus. What's the Angus and Robertson bit? <laughs> Is that the bookshop? That's their that's their outlet. Okay, but they do sell it at Hairs and High Angus as well. well. What what does the future hold for Wayne? Another book. Are you working on another book? I now? am at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Does it have a title yet? Yeah. Yes, but I'm not discussing <laughs> it. If I may. Thank you so much for the interview, Wayne. And I really I do recommend it. it's a great book. My pleasure. <laughs> I have a lot of favourite videos and in my very busy schedule I do take a few moments out now and then to sit down with a cup of Milo, an old good old cigarette and pop something to the VCR. Now my favourite one is in fact one that the viewers will find quite enlightening. It is an exclusive for you this evening Kay. It is in fact Reform School Girls. Right, Reform School Girls. Which is in fact something which I've never spoken about publicly before, okay? It is semi-autobiographical. It is about my life as a youngster, as a rampant, vulgar lesbian. My mother tossed me into a reform school to sort me out, to teach me the ways of the world, and reform me completely to the person I am today. Reform School Girls is in fact about a group of girls who get sent along to this reform school to get straightened out. But little do they know when they get there that this place is actually ruled by the very, very, very tough matron Edna, 
who is in fact a lesbian. And doesn't she make the freak pale by comparison? What are they wearing here? It's going back to 1988, K. We're talking string bikinis, we're talking thigh-high boots, we're talking cut-off tees, and we're talking at least two inches of regrowth. On the hair? I, on the hair. And I can tell you, it's going to come back, Kay. It's going to come back with a bang. I have been scouring the op shops for months to get every string bikini in town, and summer 1997 is going to be the summer of the string bikini and cut-off tea. You know, we got off to a bad start, but uh, now that Edna even the score, maybe we can start fresh. My name's Charlie. Mm -hmm. I know who you are. These are my girls. You call them girls? Hey! Still gonna play it cool, huh? I'm not gonna play it all. Listen, snob, you better learn real fast about life behind the iron here. Because it's real important who you move with. Right. You know, things would be real easy for you if you and your friend would decide to fall in with me and my girls. The proud crowd, huh? Stella, tell us about your favourite performances in this film. Well, I think by far it's um, the performance played by Pat Ast. Now, Pat Ast is one of the Warhol girls, hailing from the days of the Warhol factory, who in fact starred in many of Warhol's films. Pat plays Matron Edna. <laughs> now, I don't think anybody else in Filmland could play the role of Matron Edna, except maybe for Terry Ann Davis from the front bar of the Prince of Wales Hotel. And this character, which of course is biographically based on myself, is played by Wendy O. Williams, who of course in the 80s, New York, the Plasmatics, you might remember, and she does sing um, or provide um, her soundtrack to the movie. And we, I shouldn't mention it, but there is in fact something that we can't go past, it's the token male. Now, in fact, I don't even know his name. In fact, it's so token, it's so predictably anonymous. I don't think we'll talk I, about him. I don't think it's necessary to even mention his name. Wash your ass, you. Make him pay, that's what I say. For a good high cucumber, I'd give it away. Please don't say cucumber. I think that guy doesn't wear a uniform. He ain't no guard. He hide open. Does he live in the grounds? I don't think so. He leaves the cab every night after like that. So, before we wrap up tonight, Stella, a final assessment of this film. Well, Kay, even though I watch it time and time again and weep into my tissues, it, the bottom line is it's a load of crap. <laughs> About that midsummer, look at your little, what's in your bag? It's condoms and dams oh, yes. for us safe sex slots to yes. hand out. Oh, and we hope only that they're in a pram, it's not to do with babies at all. Oh really, no, no, it? it's to do with safe sex. I rode it, with dykes on bikes. Like this year? Yeah. And they just dumped you down the end and went away and parked? No, we've just come back to watch. Tell me, did you come along especially for Pride Much or you just found yourself in the right location? Um, bit of both. We actually heard about it and came down, yes. Uh, I think it means more because of, you know, where I've come in the last 12 months and... Have you? Yeah. Have you had a little bit of a personal journey? Yeah, personal journey. And we're here with GLOBE today, the Gay and Lesbian Organisation of Business and Enterprise. But it's great to get around, you know. You never have to sit at the lights as long as the cars do. That's right. You just and, and there's also the image thing. Oh, yeah. Well, that's important, isn't it? It is. Yeah. What's her name? Jordan. Jordan? Yeah. Spelt with a J or a G? J. J. J, yes. How old is Jordan? Four months. Now, did Jordan come down the street with us all? Yeah. Yep. You've actually used your uh, your sash That's right. with all the banners, all the badges on it. Yeah, well, you know. Do they all have a meaning? They do, actually. We actually, we were late, so we kind of just followed the first group down and just came and sat down. She just flew back from Bali. Is that a heritage thing? It is a heritage thing, yes. Your Scottish heritage? Robertson. Robertson. I'm a Robertson. <laughs> and are these the colours of the Robertsons? These, no, these are not actually. Now I wonder if these people down here actually know that there's a Pride March on. We're just going to wander down and say hello to them. I'm getting sand in my shoes. Hi there. Hi. Oh, you're here at the beach? Yeah. Oh, now, did you come down with the Pride March or came to the beach just for itself? The Pride March. I am. Well, we both live in St Kilda. So it's a... Oh, well, you couldn't really miss it, could you? Oh, no, 30,000 people in, in invading your suburb. It's fantastic. 
I say, so it's quite a good idea ending up down here. Isn't it, it is. We're about to go for a swim. Are you? Yes. We're very brave. I hope you make it through all the pollution. We like the grass area because we like to play soccer on the grass area, and it's just they've taken over. Yeah. It just so happens that it happens to be a good day and good weather. And did you come down with the pride mark? Yeah, I did. Actually. And you brought your bathers as well. I know. I know. We're fully equipped. You know. I'm going to ask you a controversial question. Well, I want to know about this big kind of supermarket thing they're building down in Ackland Street. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Well, we were actually involved in trying to fight that development. Is it cold in there? Um, cold it's out. absolutely beautiful. Why don't you come and join me? Well, I'm just by just do that. <laughs> I didn't bring my bathers, but I'm wearing stretch fabrics. <laughs> You're kind of a regular to the beach front? Yeah. No, you get it's a, very it's a couple here for you. Oh, my heavens. She's got no clothes on at all. Yeah, I like bet you don't get to see sights like that all the time. Oh, yeah, I do at home. Soccer's <laughs> the one where you have to hit it with your head, isn't it? No, you don't, you don't have to. It's an option. So, are you an official volleyball group? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, we are. Are we? It's quite a big movement in St Kilda to sort of preserve the nature of the sort of sport. They are very, very strongly focused and, you know, very strong community feeling here. Can you ask me a provocative question? Oh, well, let's see. Are you resident of St Kilda? No. Well, how can I ask if you're not a resident of <laughs> No provocative questions. No, no, we're vanilla television. Thank you so much for the chat.